Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Very excited to be joined by our special guest today, Jim Mafood, to uh, take a look at Paul Pope's Batman Year 100 Issue 1. Before we dive into this, want to uh, ask everybody to honor Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July. This coming Saturday, the last Saturday in July, we're asking all of our audience to pull out your doubles, pull out your comps, take those to the local lending libraries. A lot of our communities have these and stock them with comics. We know that uh, they are a place that readers go looking for something. So uh, let's try to build some new comic book readers by putting some good comics in these little local lending libraries. Uh, we also ask everybody to like, follow and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that subscribe button, hit the notification button. You'll be the first ones in line whenever you see us look at a comic book in the morning that you want to add to your collection. You can start tracking down that book before it disappears or before the price goes up, uh, what we call the kayfabe effect here. Also, let these videos play through to the end, and it'll allow YouTube to share our videos with other comics fans that haven't found cartoonist kayfabe yet. And now uh, let's dive into this. Jim Mafood, guest of honor. Where should people look for more of your work right now? Oh man, uh, jimmafood.com. Uh, if you want to score Girl Scout Stone Ghost, if it's not available in your uh, local comic shop, I've got signed copies of my books, prints, and minis there. Zestworld.com for brand new Girl Scouts online comics. And uh, Jim Mafood on Twitter and Instagram. Excellent. All right, let's dive into this. So Paul Pope, one of the um, big creators to come out of the 90s, I feel like very influential to maybe a couple generations of cartoonists at this point. And he goes from self-publishing to doing work at Vertigo and then Batman Year 100, about as big high profile of a book as you can possibly do, kind of blew my mind because I was reading him when he was self-publishing. And whenever he shows up doing a Batman book, it is like, all right, this radical indie creator, alternative creator, Let's see what happens in front of a mainstream audience. The, the lines were blurred because this <laughs> is something that indeed. was not done. You know, you never like maybe you got a Jaime cover on Transmetropolitan one or two times. Uh, Klaus did that uh, Bizarro world cover that like didn't yeah. show up in the final printed version. There would be it would be so meager the amount of like independent cartoonist infiltration of the mainstream but uh, the Paul Pope thing, it's, it, it felt like it made sense because his his work was already of a kind of a, a pulp tradition, you know, where a lot of indie comic stuff at the time was like navel gazing, uh, you know, Gen X type shit. Like he at least had some whimsical stuff going down in THB. I also remember reading, you know, following him and reading interviews where he would talk about Kirby as an influence, yeah. which would blow my mind because I'm seeing like black and white brushwork. And what I was looking at in his work felt really different. And once he points out the Kirby influence, it was like, oh, yeah, I see that in there, you know, matched yeah. up with European and manga influences. So for sure, uh, I do want to mention Jose Villarubia on color because otherwise Paul Pope is handling the, the art and writing on this. But Jim, you mentioned this as one of the comics you were interested in talking about. Tell us why. Tell us about Paul Pope and Batman Year 100 for you. Yeah, well, I mean, I was lucky enough to meet Paul in the late 90s, early 2000s through Bob Shrek and the Oni Press connection and had great respect for his work and THB. And uh, he's just a good guy in person. I mean, we're friends and, and uh, you know, I was always blown away by his sensibility. You know, I don't know if you guys saw it, but he did a couple short Batman things before he did this. He did like a short story called Sidekick, uh, which James Jean colored, I believe. Right. In the solo and then he issue. Did, yeah, yeah. And he did a Batman black and white story called Broken Nose. Um, so, I mean, I knew that he was capable of, of doing anything with with this, especially this character in this world. You know, Paul's a New York guy. I, you can feel the New York gritty city vibe in his work. So him doing his own series with this just made perfect sense. And Bob Shrek is obviously the editor on this. So that's the connection. Um, I talked to Paul on the phone yesterday in preparation of this and he let me know that before starting this project, Bob and him got Frank Miller's blessing on this project because this book does sort of exist in the framework of the Miller Batman. And there's a couple nods to like Dark Knight Returns in this and stuff. And 
we'll address it when we see it. But like, it was important. And all three of those guys were in New York at the time hanging out together. So Paul was like, it was important for me to, you know, get Frank's blessing, make this my own thing, but also pay tribute to what had come before. And as you guys can imagine, I mean, there's a weight on any creator of, you're given your own Batman thing that you're writing and drawing. What are you going to bring to the table? Like, how are you going to pull this off? And one thing that I love that I told Paul yesterday was right off the bat, this first page, he shows us Batman in his full splendor. Like some artists choose to do Batman hidden. He only shows up for five pages. He's a dark silhouette shape in the background. With Paul's story, it's like, no, I'm giving you Batman right off the bat. He's basically on every page. Here's his costume. He's wearing combat boots. He's wearing boxer, like fighters, trunks, you know? He's got like the old style gloves that are a tribute to the Batman from Detective Comics 27. He's wearing a belt a utility belt that looks like something you could buy at a hardware store. That's exactly what you know, it looks so, like, a construction so, worker belt. <laughs> you know, this necessarily isn't the billionaire Batman that we know. It, it isn't revealed really who this Batman is. And I think that's one of the key parts of this story is what's going on here. There's a level of mystery here. It's such a good, I mean, that could be a cover you know, that first yeah. splash page. It's so, like, you're in it. He's bleeding his guts. Even the blood kind of looks like um, it's thick. It almost looks like his intestines are coming out. Yeah. 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 It's such a provocative character. Certainly a nod to the Golden Age with the way that he positions that, that cowl. And Adam West, really. Like, you see the seams of the, of the draws, and it's like a sweater. You know, it's like a tight shirt. Has the Adam West cowl. Oh, Totally. And you're getting and, that um, Paul Pope drawing stuff, like some of these shadowy, like the structures behind them, the lines, almost like the motion lines on the ground, things that I would associate with his work when I first started looking at it. And it's all brush. So it's like a, ha a hatching line that you would uh, often see done certainly with like a pen. Yeah. But he's he's slinging that brush. He's, he's, got, a th he's got a thick brush too, man. Like he's, he's like the first guy, I feel like, that was like, you don't need that. Windsor Newton number two, like you could use a seven. Right. Jim, do you know you, I, when you talked to him, was he drawing these like bigger than, cause for a while he would work really big, like two up. Do you know if he was drawing these very yeah. large? These are uh 19 by 24. Wow. And so you guys, what was crazy is I was visiting New York when he was working on this book and I went to the DC offices to visit Shrek and he had like the original first 10 pages from this issue. And I got to, hold them and, you know, look through them. It was mind blowing to see them in person. You know, it, they look great here, but can you imagine just seeing the lush black line work on just the original art? It's really mind blowing, man. And Paul told me that he, this opening sequence of Batman running from the dogs, he was listening to a lot of uh, Bach and Be Beethoven for, um, <laughs> for, you know, uh, just a sensory inspiration and mood, you know, that this epicness of this lone character being chased and, you know, there's no dialogue. It's just the first like five or six pages are Batman escaping these dogs. And we obviously have this amazing like manga inspired storytelling. Yes. Uh, but with this, you know, uh, European fluidity of the lush brushwork and, he, I just think he's a master man of fusing all this great stuff together. I think that manga influence was one of the big pieces that uh, attracted me to his work initially. I wouldn't have been able to articulate that at the time, but I look back and it's so on display in this sequence and it's on display in a lot of his work. And it's something that I don't think a lot of mainstream, you know, Marvel DC creators were incorporating in the 90s. And he yep. had it, and it was really a breath of fresh air. I look at this page, I'm lingering on this panel. It's so great of Batman actually doing the leap between buildings. And uh, you mentioned, you know, he's living in New York at the time of this. I don't know if you can draw this if you're not living in New York or some comparable big city where you can really get the scope of that. When it comes yeah. to just, just picture making also, he's a guy, like, I know him for these kinds of compositions where he will push the focal point 
further to the edges than, than a lot of people. Like we all sort of agree and know that you don't center things up but he will push that main focal point super high, super low. We'll see a lot of uh, examples of that throughout throughout this uh, this issue. Yep. One thing I want to mention too, before I forget, is um, Paul told me him and Jose purposefully decided to not have white in between the as the panel gutters. So he's using white purposefully on just Batman's eyes, you know, word balloons, obviously, but they, they made the conscious decision of like, let's, let's have this be a toned look throughout the book, you know? Yeah. It's interesting to see where he does hit with, with more saturated or lighter colors. Um, one of the whites, the dog teeth. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. It's almost like this pukey color. It's like the base underpainting of everything. And then the other colors are just put on top because it's even pretty dark, you know? It is. Yep. Yeah, we often talk about the darkness and this is about as dark as you can get, but you can see the darks really uh, feels more conscious whenever you see these, you know, a light blue, a concentrated red, um, even the neon yellow effects on the sign in the background. It feels like that darkness is very conscious as opposed to, oh, I messed up mixing my colors and put too much black in that CMY mix. Right. The red from the dirigibles, probably on the very next page, is pretty stunning stuff. Yes. Like, that's so good. That 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 just feels uh, dangerous. Yeah, and what a focal point. You know, like, so clear how that red is drawing your eye right through the page. Oh, yeah. I, I love and, how I mean, the mood, the mood of this, he's est establishing this, you know, Blade Runner-esque. It's uh, 2038 in this story. You know, a hundred years literally after Batman's first appearance in Detective 27 in 1938 uh, or 39. I'm sorry, which year? I yeah, 39. Okay, 39. okay, 39. Okay. So, yeah, a hundred years after Batman's first Detective Comics appearance. And, uh, you know, story wise, it's like Batman's on the run. We have these special cops outside of the Gotham Police Department, separate from Gotham that are federal agents that are, you know, chasing him and uh, busting into this lone kid's uh, room here. They have, they have like football jerseys. They do, shit. yeah. Uh, great dialogue. You see anybody come this way, guy dressed like Dracula? And That's you, good stuff. And you see our guy right, right there, man. Just barely, too. That's something I would have missed in the first read through for sure. I love these guys coming down the zip lines, though, onto the roof and the red light. Very strong stuff. And they move on. Um, the interiors of those old buildings, too, is something I think Pope does really well. Like, it really grounds this in a physical world. Yeah, and that's another thing. Uh, that goes back to, though, that, like, he's a New Yorker. Like, he knows these apartments. He knows the molding on the wall. He knows, like, what the doors look like. You know, it's it does have that feel. And um, I love this little moment, too. This little kid hands Batman a Superman toy. <laughs> and he just is like, ah. You know, it's not, it's not explained. It's, it's, uh, because in this story, Batman, you know, masked heroes are long gone and extinct. And, um, everyone in the world is, or at least in America is being monitored. Like the government knows your every move. And so the fact that this unidentified character, Batman shows up, they don't know what to make of this, you know? I love whenever Batman does get like the police pass him by. And now as he goes the other direction, it's still on the run. It's like full speed to get, you know, it, it sells how tense this is, what he's yeah. doing and trying to escape. And then we cut to a shot of the Capitol. Uh, Jim, you mentioned, you know, all of the citizens are being monitored closely and stuff like that. This feels so much um, not in the same world as Dark Knight Returns, but like I think about it, right? It's a four issue prestige series. It's the same format as the original Dark Knight. And it feels like it bringing in like a more federal kind of national storyline to, yep. you know, a little local hero. Well, and also both books and even um, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Strikes Again, they all have this paranoia in them of, of the government and the government gone bad and people being monitored. And, you know, there, there's these certain themes that I think work really well in the Batman universe. And this idea of a lone crazy guy running around dressed up as a bat and and being able to evade you know the this this system of of of, of constant observation and monitoring 
this little tech piece right here, man, of like the little gate, whatever you call that, man. You see that 28, man. You have to think of Otomo a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's accidental. Yeah. I love these guys pouring over the screens, too. I mean, I don't know when this book comes out. Is this like 06 or so? But it feels like this is uh, somehow even more timely now. Yeah. You know, he hasn't gone off the ra- the The present hasn't gone off the rails of his future just, uh, ideas just yet. Just surrounding the Capitol with barbed wire. That feels like that could have happened uh, January 7th. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. I think it was, yeah, either 05 or 06. Paul told me he started the drawing in 03, but really got into the meat of it in, in like 2004. Um, so, but man, I mean, again, with New Yorkers being there for 9-11, there's that paranoia in the work still of, of you know. Um, and the Patriot the, Act was in effect. Yeah. And, and you're yeah. having dinner uh, with Frank Miller. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sure. The the paranoia at a uh, at a ten around that those parts. So I love see... this. Yeah, on the left hand side, this guy calls out that it's the legend, the myth of the Batman, and the the main dude literally does a spit take. You know, uh, uh, realizing that what this what this could mean. You know, it is great too. I love any time there's a drawing like this where. I don't want to have to draw a spit take. If I'm collaborating with some uh, writer that's listening to this, I don't want to have to draw this kind of stuff. That's a hard right. drawing to figure out. So yeah. kudos to uh, Pope for pulling that one off. And then, you know, wasting no time, like you said, Batman is really in this issue. So if you're here for Batman and who's buying this book that isn't, you're getting mm-hmm. rewarded right away. It's not like you have to buy all four issues to get some good Batman stuff. I would say the, right. the one thing that's missing with, with this project is... All you have to do is look at THB to know what I'm talking about. But the way that uh, Pope can incorporate sound effects with the artwork is spectacular. And this, unfortunately, is just keyboard clacking. Probably, uh, who is it? Fletcher and and Workman. Jared Fletcher and John Workman are your uh, letters credited on here. Yeah, but even Workman isn't like hand lettering like like we know John Workman's lettering to be. It's just keyboard clacking for that also. It's tough to get past that at this stage. You know, like that's such a standard operating process for a DC book in, in, you know, 2006. It's interesting because some of the stuff Paul is obviously hand lettering and yeah, then like this kind of stuff. I don't know if it's a decision later where they're adding a couple extra sound effects. And those are obviously digital because you can really I mean, your eye can really pick up the difference between Pope's hand script with compared to the, you know, the digital. Yeah. Yeah. And like oh, his, so. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say his THB, you do see his hand lettering too, where, you know, that's what also I feel some lettering is fine. And sometimes it's a real contrast with the art style. And his style is such a hand done style that you do get that hard contrast with perfect word balloons and, and super clear lettering like this. Jimmy, before you turn the page, this is great because the head fed guy is being shown a monitor from you know, a live feed, the helmet oh, of, yeah. of the cops that are going after Batman. And this is a fantastic page turn moment where on the right side page, you see him looking down and then we get the page turn of what he's about to see. <laughs> Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. Red Room Trigger Warnings, the second season of Red Room, all self-contained stories, issues one to four, now available in comic shops everywhere. Red Room, the anti-social network, the trade paperback collection of the first season of Red Room, now available in comic shops everywhere, minus 28 countries where it's banned in 10 comic shops, but you can still request it there. And coming in September, the collection, the trade paperback of Red Room Trigger Warnings will be in stores in September. You can pre-order that now at your local comic shop or online wherever you buy your books. Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness in comic shops everywhere. The 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing, lettering, coloring, the Grand Design treatment, retelling that 60-year history. And you can now pre-order the Hulk Grand Design Oversized Treasury Collection, uh, about 40 extra pages in that. It'll be in stores before Christmas, but you can pre-order it now in your comic shops or in your bookstores wherever you're you buy comics and now back to our regular scheduled programming. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. 
I wonder if Paul Pope makes this, if this is like a Xerox kind of played with, you know, like some of it looks, he's drawing these kind of eye exaggerations, but there's so much of that texture that feels almost like, how do you create that? It's such a good image. It's an yeah. amazing yeah. image. It's almost a splash page of this monster Batman. I know. I should have asked him about this, but I'm assuming he is in control and he did all this himself. You know, he he wouldn't allow anyone else to, you know, touch such an important moment. And it's like, this is the Fed's like first image they're seeing of this character. We, the viewers, have already seen Batman go through this whole thing in the beginning of the book, but it still has this huge impact moment of, holy shit, what is this? character what is this you know creature yeah it's, it's really great. great it's really great i yeah. love the drawing of the eyes it's, and then the close-up of the mouth opening absolutely man i mean that is the, that's that otomo like car headlight yeah blur. tail light yep. this is one of those pages that uh makes me really want to see this book in black and white because you see the yep. sort of bottom heavy composition with this kind of thing and just as a whole page as a black and white image i just you could tell that that's that's a fantastic one he had done a bunch of um work in japan and i think the book was called smoke navigator i don't think it was ever completely published but he would do excerpts in some of the thbs and they really remind me of some of this structure uh and drawing this would be a beautiful book as a uh as an artist edition especially Absolutely. a big oversized oh, yeah. like that oh yeah i'd settle for a noir yeah that would be really great too just even for something like this oh please uh Paul, please tell DC to get on that. Let's get an artist edition of this. Um, a bit of trivia on this. I believe when this book came out, it was chosen as like, you know, the America's best comics collections every year. And I think DC would not give them the rights to reprint any of anything from it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they're wow. not they're not gonna do any they're not gonna do Paul Paul any favors, you know? Because that's the Weird. only reason you wouldn't do it. Like, why wouldn't you do a commercial for your comic? It's and really some bizarre. Thing? It's really bizarre because it's huh. it's an it's an ad that says this is one of the best books of the year, DC. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't? Yeah. I Real don't dumb. Know. Maybe this a, uh, feud with that. If you publisher. go back one, Jimmy, this like bounty hunter specialist guy shows up to capture Batman. His name is Tibble, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, Paul told me that he's he's kind of based on like a Robert Mitchum type character he looks like and, it uh, here the teeth are severe yeah yeah it's kind of his coolest feature because he doesn't look like a lot yet yeah it uh later on he's like wearing a, a cowboy hat and it's just like oh he's a full-blown good like, boy cowboy type character you know gunslinger type character i really like the fed response right because he's like there's glee in your voices. He's furious over this. And there's like a bunch of legit awe at this uh, this existence, right? Yeah. Is, is, well, this, it, is it Al Gore? Oh, wow. I mean, it's not his name, but right. it could be based on him. But this head, head fed guy, I mean, he straight up has a panic attack realizing that there's an undocumented citizen out there and that it could even be the return of a masked superhero or vigilante so i think paul in this book and the whole series does this really great job of setting up the mythos of batman being this urban legend and and a uh, uh, outsider almost scary character and he would certainly be scary to the authorities that have established absolute rule over everyone yeah no doubt about it i love the color here like getting the orange and pinks almost fluorescent as he's getting sick because you we haven't seen this color yet you know it's a really good use of like something's wrong in this guy's world although it's funny because he's coming from like this green world <laughs> you would think this might be a little bit better than where he was but it's a very effective coloring trick you know drawing a panic attack how difficult is that oh yeah yeah, yeah. interesting textures used on the color on his face real blotchy mm -hmm. you don't see that almost anywhere else it's usually kind of flat color a little bit of a nod i think some of this uh this team to batman year one which is smart if you're going to do a big batman book like reference these hits um but batman looks like he's been through it too that's the other piece that i think is really effective he's creating these moments of breather but like is that a spotlight or is that a piece of caution tape yeah i think it's close-up details of what we're seeing down here you know railings but also like the tape that's uh 
cutting this part off. Pope will yeah. have the balls to do that, though, to just, like, give you such a little little glimpse. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And look how effective that just the white eyes, again, of Batman are on that. You I know, just kind of yeah. carving out that shape, you know. Yeah, comic language. Yeah, having, like, a little breath. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Definitely brings some stuff to comics that, that wasn't popular, uh, you know, whenever he shows up. His hands, the way he inks his hands, like I, I want to see, I want to see a video of him doing, because it's just this like motion of this squiggle, and it's one continuous line, and I think it's just, it's just a beautiful line. I would love to see it, that get put down. There's that great uh, th or uh, heavy metal cover, and it's just a close up of a hand with like the dropper, but it has like so much character and all the knuckles and fingers. He does yeah, this and... stuff too, like the extreme close up, draw, draw attention to it very well with the hands. Yep. You know, he's a Columbus, Ohio dude, and, and he was affiliated. Like, he knows Lucy Caswell and people at the Billy Ireland and all that stuff. And imagine, like, having access to all that Noel Sickles, Milk Kniff. Like, those are some brush-slinging motherfuckers, man. And you get, oh, yeah. you get access to that in your own hometown. Man, I never even thought about it. It's like you have to ink with the brush if you're, in, uh, if you're coming up in Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Smith is uh, another one of these brush guys, yeah. you know. You think of that heritage. And speaking of hands, like, look at all this hand stuff with, I, I mean, that top panel on the right side with that, I could never pull off something like that or even think about it. It's like, this is just an extreme close up of a hand holding a communicator device, you know, and he, he does it so elegantly and, and it just looks exciting and, and enticing. It's amazing. He really does. And this is kind of that manga um, effect, right? Where we're getting yes. like seven panels of this. You know him just pulling this device out of the out of the belt. Cool to see an updated Batman utility belt, like you mentioned. You know that that workman belt, but it it is a unusual sequence, totally opposite of like your traditional superhero language. Yeah, and this kind of stuff. There's some of his hand lettering that we were talking about. You know his lettering integrates a little bit better, but again, it's that manga storytelling, right? Just drops of rain landing around him. It's a great transition because it's. It's him, but the, now it's the windshield of of their car. This stuff's easy to take for granted too. That he develops the tech, like the uh, the cars. You know what do they look like? Thirty years in the future, and you see yep. it's just a little more round. You know, it's little details that feels a little Kirby esque to me too. You know, you think of some of his seventies books that were showing future tech. Really great too. Hand reflection in the window. Small throwaway details that mean everything. And this is one of Batman's allies, um, a, a, I guess a doctor or some kind of medical person that helps clean him up, but is being called to the crime scene. So Batman's going to have to try not to bleed out in the next hour or so before she can get there. HR bleached her hair. <laughs> yeah, she's working with, uh, I believe this is James Gordon's uh, grandson, mm -hmm. uh, who just so happens to look exactly like James <laughs> yeah, right. Gordon. you gotta do which that is, which, which is cool i mean that's you can do that in comics like that's fine uh but yeah it's like you know batman has a uh a hacker a doctor and a mechanic at his disposal and that's basically all he needs in this incarnation of of where he's at in this series and then he eventually has an inside man in the Gotham Police Department through this new James Gordon character. That's later in the series, but I mean, we're just looking at issue one, but that was something that Paul was talking to me about, was like, yeah, he's like, there's no Batcave, there's no Alfred, there's no this, that, or the other. It's just this badass Batman with basically this team of four people that help him do everything he needs to do. This seems like a risky move, though, making a call on, on a uh, possibly an open line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is an interesting way they set up this story, or Paul sets up the story, in that we don't have any answers either as to who this Batman is. So we're yeah. kind of in the same position as everybody else in the story, uh, with the exception of his two or three allies, in that we're trying to figure out who is this guy and how does he exist in this in this weird world without anyone knowing. Yep. And of course, James uh, or uh, Jim Gordon going to be confronted by the feds, and this is no longer uh, a local crime scene. They're taken over and pushing him out. Yep. Straight up hockey goons. And not only that, once it becomes apparent that it's Batman, they're almost accusing him of being, you know, in cahoots with this. Like, how do we have a vigilante here? And here's your your bounty hunter showing up. Yeah. Tibble, Tibble. Rocking, rocking the full cowboy 
outfit and then putting Gordon in his place and letting him know, like, we're in charge, you're cut out. And like you said, Jimmy, it's like, how could you have allowed this to exist in your city? And, you know, Gordon didn't know that, that this character was out there, you know. Yeah, and taking taking him in for some questions, <laughs> not just pushing him out of the uh, investigation, but accusing him. It's funny how these guys, like the fashion version of these Fed agents, you know, like that feels like the fashion is something I think of Paul Pope is being uh, conscious about, especially with his characters and comics. So it's kind of interesting, interesting to me the uh, future fashions that he's assigning to some of these characters. Definitely. And it's all based on real world fashion. It just has that slight Pope tweak to it to make it fit into his universe. You know, I, I really like that. This is a cool choice for the, um, the Gotham police department. It feels like such a sci-fi fortress kind of future building. Yeah. Of just oppression. It towers over everything. And all concrete, no windows, really. Great choices. Yeah. Yeah, it's intimidating. He must have spent a ton of time doing that kind of stuff, just like developing the details that would go into this world from cars to fashion to buildings. It's a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Gordon's being interrogated, and basically there's a telepath uh, in the other room who's letting them know, like, okay, he's denying he knew about Batman. He's telling the truth, but we need to, you know, monitor him and make sure we stay on top of like what he knows good figure stuff too that guy's almost a gorilla those proportions yes. yeah he has black fingernails yellow teeth yeah the dogs have whiter teeth than him <laughs> dogs not easy to draw not easy to draw animals or animals in motion or you know what i mean i, I just as a cartoonist, you just look at certain things. You're like, I don't want to draw that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it. He really gives them a monster quality too. They're very threatening. Yeah. Our, our uh, guy, Batman, not, not looking too good. Not faring well. This little kind of cutaway thing is real sharp. Just real dilapidated. That's that attention to the buildings. You know, like he's always great at that. You look at any of his comics and they have that quality. And it's funny because he's living in New York, like you said, when he does this, Jim. But like even the stuff THB, like when he's still in Ohio, has that kind of quality of like uh, like aged architecture and, and real Definitely. three dimensional spaces. It's just got to be something that he has an eye for and is interested in because it's it's in as many of the comics of his as I can think of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, you know, Pope, I mean, obviously, I'm sure he's studying books on architecture, fashion, you know, he's not just looking at like comics, obviously, he's, his uh, breadth of influence is, is probably massive and international in, in, a, in a major way. Um, I love this sequence of like, you know, Batman makes it back to the safe house and the mom, the doctor who's the mom and her daughter are, are you know, literally saving him basically. And, you know, they're, they're gonna have to like, take quick action to plug up the holes and figure out how to like cut off the mask. And we, but we still don't get the reveal of, you know, who this guy is. Another uh, page or sequence where the hands are the stars, you know, yes. getting into, into the bloody uh, life-saving parts. Man, it's, it's great. The scalpel going in for the mat or the scissors going in for the mask, super close up there of a sharp steel edge. Again, reference clearly to Dark Knight Returns. Yes, that's what I wanted to point out of like, okay, well, this is the lightning crack behind those silhouetted buildings. That's directly, you know. I feel uh, like those those buildings are light boxed. You know, all the gargoyles on the side, it's super Frank Miller. Yeah. And uh, taking off the boot reminds me almost of like old war stories and stuff when people would talk about like trench foot and just like how tough you know war was on on feet and it feels like it has that quality of like real material there yeah you know like yeah. there's a real weight and, and texture to that that's this is the carrie kelly moment whenever you know she's triaging batman in, in dkr and i love it like the final piece is he'll survive that's a pretty good ending for a cliffhanger kind of uh, end of issue one like all right 
let's keep going. Let's yeah, run this back. Yeah, we really haven't even... I mean, he was on the run for the most part. He had a couple... If it wasn't for that, like, one menacing image or or two, he he's he's the underdog in the entire issue. Yeah, you don't get any, any real answers in this issue. It's a good setup in that regard, I think. I mean, four-issue series, like, you can't give away too much in the first one, but it's also very satisfying. If you're here to see Paul Pope do Batman... You get to see a lot of that in the same THB oh, yeah. spirit. The the inside cover matter develops the world like pretty pretty thoroughly. You know, like we we talk about that. You know, the the image comics and how <laughs> the interviews that they did in like Hero Illustrated and Wizard Magazine give you the scoop of like what we're supposed to expect from that these characters are, but you never see it in the issue. Uh, Pope is using this real estate as just a, another world building piece you could choose to read that and get a good understanding of the world that our batman is dropped into so another good touch and thb would have that there would be playlists and the oh, music yeah. that you need to listen to while yep. uh reading the issue and whatnot and uh that front cover that batman year 100 logo was designed by an australian gentleman named adrian clifford and paul convince DC to like outsource that to this Australian design studio because he was a fan of this guy's work. And I guess Adrian turned in a bunch of different versions of this logo. And the first versions were like very, very abstracted where you couldn't even read Batman and year 100. It was just this crazy like bat shape. So they kind of had to work with Adrian to like really let it be known that this says Batman, but it still maintains that futuristic bat kind of design so i think the logo like really adds to the sensibility of this universe and it, it vibes with paul's work like i i asked him if he had designed it but he it was he didn't it was just his sensibility though to like get this other guy to do it you know it's cool that you uncovered that because that logo says paul pope to me also you know like some of those curvy shapes and and the little doodads that feels popish yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this cover. I really like kind of the restrained color on it. It, it. it feels different. I think it works well. And that logo is a part of it. That That is a cool detail. It's such a provocative Batman too, like in, in the true sense of the word, like this in a Wednesday warrior capacity on the stand, this lets you know everything. So like the guy who's the regular Batman reader, that's like, this looks wrong. He's not even going to fuck with this. He knows to leave this <laughs> right. one alone because you're not getting just same old, same old monster of the week, bad guy of the week, sent on the Arkham Asylum comic. This is some other shit. Definitely. And Paul uh, was really excited because he said this was, when this came out, DC wasn't quite sure about what it was going to do. DiDio was kind of like, let's, let's see what happens. Um, but it was the first prestige format style book since the killing joke that sold out in the first day the first two issues of this sold out in the first day so that was an indicator of like this is going to be a success people do want other interpretations of batman it's going to do well pope has a big enough following and i mean me and all my friends went out and bought this the first day it came out oh, yeah. so to me it was just something definitely worth looking at uh the last story is Paul was in Bob Shrek's office at DC when they were figuring out the schedule for this series. And Bob was kind of like, listen, man, we got to, we got to get going on this. We got to get serious. Like you got to get into the first issue. Like we need to like make shit happen. And Paul was kind of like feeling the pressure of this. And he saw there's a train spotting poster in Shrek's office. And he saw the uh, Ewan McGregor character on the poster with the shaved head. And he walked out of Shrek's, office at DC and like went to a barber shop that day and got all of his luxurious rock and roll long hair completely shaved off and like went into a almost militaristic Batman making mode of like, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to make this shit happen. And I was like joking with him. I was like, dude, you became one of the sons of the bat <laughs> from Dark Knight Returns. They all had shaved heads. I'm like, you probably painted the bat symbol on your face like a psycho. He's like, no, I didn't, I didn't do the bat signal, but you know, he's like, I got into this 
kind of mind frame by physically sort of transforming myself in a way and and knowing like okay no distractions it's time to handle like basically the biggest project of my career up to this point and i think he delivered man in in spades i i couldn't recommend this issue and this whole four issue series uh more you know it's awesome yeah for sure we're gonna have to dig into some uh some of the other issues in in, in the future but i'm good if you're good Jim Mahfoud, what do you have out there that the people need to get their hands on? Yes, uh, like I mentioned, Girl Scout Stone Ghost in comic shops right now. My latest and greatest comic book series. Score books, prints, and minis at jimmahfoud.com. Zestworld.com for my brand new exclusive Girl Scouts online comics. And if you're on the social medias, I feel bad for you, but um, hmm. <laughs> Jim, Jim Mahfoud on Instagram and Twitter. Jim, what do you got? Hulk Grand Design, the Treasury Collection. Uh, Pre-order it now at your local comic shop or wherever you buy books. That is coming out in December. Perfect for uh, Christmas gifts this year. It collects both Hulk Grand Design issues along with about 40 pages of extras. Best book I ever made. So pick that one up and join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see more of my comics art. You can download some of my out-of-print zines and mini comics. Red Room Trigger Warnings. Trade Paperback is going to be hitting stores in September 2022. Uh, you can hit my link tree in the description below this video to uh, get your hands on it, pre-order it, or order current Red Room comics. And my Patreon link is there also. I put up new strips every Tuesday. Three bucks gets you the archive over there. What else do we have, Jimmy? You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another great way to support the channel, given those marching orders will be on our way. Read more comics. <laughs>